quickly knew that that was not enough space. So we moved here and been here since then. Um, obviously, we now are in this space, so we'll have to look for another venue. <laughs> but with David Plant, word is getting out there. Uh, yay! I'd like everyone to please silent your cell phones. We don't want to hear that that tune while we while we have our speaker here. I'd like to thank all of our co-sponsors and volunteers. The volunteers who brought food back there. Wait, thank you. And anybody else who brought food? Thank you. Um, I want to thank Nancy Berlin from the Master Gardeners um, County Extension Office. There she is in the back. And she did our liaison with the National Park Thank you, Nancy. Um, I want to thank the Vanessa Park Community Center for making this available to us. This is a fabulous venue, though we need one that's even bigger now. So um, I just want to briefly mention our, our sponsors. This is free for you because we have so many co-sponsors. Okay, we have the Master Gardeners. Would everybody who's a Master Gardener raise your hand? Yay. And we, they have a booth out there, so I hope that you will um, visit that. Virginia Native Plant Society members. Yay! And the Green Wildfire Society, which is a chapter of the Native Plant Society. The Bluebird Society. Yay! Thank you all for sponsoring. Um, the Ottawa Society of Northern Virginia. Thank you for being a co sponsor. Um, Bees in Scarlet, I don't know if she is here. Um, McGee Design, is John here? McGee Design, John McGee is a um, native plant landscaper. He also does the native plant podcast, and he was a, um, one of our co sponsors. The Prince William Conservation Alliance. Yay! Be sure to come to the Blue Bell Festival on April 11th at the uh, Merrimack Farm. Wildlife Management Center. Um, Virginia Master Naturalist, we're good for that. Thank you all. Elise Miro, um, Dave Plant Landscape Design. She could not come, but she brought somebody, somebody was representing her, I thought. Okay. Wild, oh, there you are. <laughs> Thank you for coming. Wild Birds Unlimited. Did, yes, the Larsons are back here. Thank you so much. And many of us are all part of the Plant Nova Natives, which is actually a group of groups. So thank you all for helping sponsor this, this big event. So I also want to note that DJ Lacrone of the Loudon Wildlife Conservancy is live streaming this event on YouTube right now. DJ, right here. <laughs> so, I don't know how many people will be watching live, but this will also go um, be available later. And we'll put out a notice as to where you can find that. Okay, now is the moment you've all been waiting for. Um, perhaps I don't even need to introduce him because I think you all are already native plant gurus and disciples of this man. But Doug Talley is a professor in the Department of Entomology and Wildlife Ecology at the University of Delaware, where he's authored 80 research articles and has taught insect taxonomy, behavioral ecology humans and natures, and other courses for 32 years. Chief among his research goals is to better understand in many ways, in a future poem, how native plants sustain wildlife in our gardens, was published by Timber Press in 2007, and was awarded the 2008 Silver Medal by the Garden Writers Association. Can you believe it's 2007? That's 13 years ago, yes. So, those have been doing the circuit since then. He was awarded the um, Garden Club of America Margaret Douglas Medal for Conservation and the Tom Dodd Award for Excellence in 2013. If you want to know his credentials, he has a BS in Biology from Allegheny College, an MS in Entomology from Rutgers University, a PhD in Entomology from the University of Maryland, and a postdoctoral fellow in Entomology from the University of Iowa. So his new book, Nature's Best Hope, which we're selling in the back. We had 88 copies. I don't know how many are left at this point. It was published and available earlier this month, and I understand that it's already sold out in its first printing. So. <laughs> so 
So please join me in giving a warm welcome to Dr. Doug Cowling. Thank you very much. Just, just to be up to date, it's not 32 years, it's actually 40 years now. Oh, so. good. Yeah, time flies. Time flies. Um, I really apologize for how nice it is outside. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to move. Uh, well, okay, it's nice, so we'll talk fast, and maybe we can get outside again. I want to talk about uh, Nature's Best Hope, that's the title of, of the new book. But before I do that, I want to talk about acorns, because this year, you probably remember, was a mass, acorn mass, or meadows from, I don't know, southern Massachusetts all the way down to North Carolina. All the red oaks got together and said, we're going to make our acorns this year, and they did. They made a whole lot of them, uh, pretty much everywhere. Now, if you are easily entertained like I am, <laughs> maybe you took an acorn and you put it on the table and just stared at it. Uh, and if you were lucky, you might have seen something happen on the side of the acorn, and it starts moving, and it starts chewing, and up comes a strange little creature. Looks like the Pillsbury Doughboy. Um, popping out of this little hole is actually a larva, a very tasty larva. So this is a dangerous time for this larva. It's the most exposed it's ever going to be in its life, so it's got to get below ground very quickly. Uh, and if you give it some ground, it will tumble underneath there in about 30 seconds. Where it stays for two years. It pupates underground for two years, then it emerges as a, an acorn weevil. You've heard about acorn weevils, but you don't actually see them that, that often. Um, weevils, of course, it looks like they have a big nose, but that's actually an extension of the, the head capsule. The mouth parts are way down here. And uh, this is a, I don't know, the males and the females look, look alike. We'll look all this a female. She will tunnel. She'll dig a little hole all the way down to the center of that acorn with that long snout. And then she turns around and lays an egg in it. And that's how the larva gets down into the center of, of the acorn. Now you might wonder why, which is a very safe place to be, by the way, when you're developing. You might wonder why it stays underground for two years. So it takes red oak acorns two years to, to completely develop. So if it came out one year, it wouldn't have any, any new acorns. Um, well, that leaves a hole. In the acorn. The acorn's still sitting there on the ground, and if it's not eaten by something else, it's, it's got a hole in it. Nature reports the vacuum, so somebody's going to use that hole, and right away, there's a group of ants called Tendothorax ants, a couple species, uh, that look for these holes, and what they want to do is live in them. They move their, their colonies in. Once they find them, they'll, they'll carry their larvae in, they carry the queen in. Um, they work very hard to get everybody inside that. That uh, hole where again they're safe. And they'll stay until the acorn essentially dissolves. So it's you know two, three years that they have a little house in that acorn. If you go out and find a red oak acorn right now with a hole in it, there's probably a tendothorax colony inside. Well, this is just one of many, many thousands of very specialized interactions that occur in nature. This is occurring right in, in my yard, probably in your yard as well. Uh, and that's what nature's built up. All these specialized relationships. If you want to have, have affiliated workers, woodpeckers, you've got to have a lot of partner ants because that's what they really come up. And you, you're not going to have partner ants unless you have a lot of big trees that make those partner ants. Uh, if you want 13 species of native bees, you need to. Do you want me to shut that? Okay. Thirteen species of native bees will only develop on the pollen of native sunflowers, helianthus. So if you don't have sunflowers in your, your yard, you're not going to have the opportunity for 13 species of specials. What I mean by specials, they can only grow their young on the pollen of that particular plant bees. If you want to have body go to tree hoppers, you've got to have oaks, because that's the only thing they're going to, going to develop. Uh, well, that's what nature is. But today, these specialized relationships and nature itself, it's on the ropes. It's on the ropes. And it's on the ropes because we did not listen to Teddy Roosevelt. But way back in 1908, he got wind of the fact that the state of Arizona was going to mine the Grand Canyon. So he went to the edge of the Grand Canyon, looked that over it, and he said, leave it as it is. Uh, and those were the days where Congress and the President talked to each other, and, and in a few years, they actually had the Grand Canyon National Park. 
So that's great. Leave it as it is. The problem is, it's too late to leave most of the U.S. as it once was. There's only about 5%, and that percentage gets smaller every year, of the lower 48 states that are anywhere close to their, their original pristine state. Uh, and that's because we have we have blocked it often many many times. We have tilled it almost everywhere. We've grazed it. We've grazed it. Rangeland, 770 million acres of rangeland in the U.S. We've paved it or otherwise developed it. Uh, we've straightened our rivers uh, and and dammed them. And you can spell that any way you want. <laughs> we've we've uh, polluted our, our skies, our atmosphere, changed our weather for centuries to come. We've drained our aquifers. We've introduced more than 3,300 species of plants from someplace else that are now drastically changing the native plant communities that support our ecosystems. Uh, and in short, we've chopped up the natural world into tiny fragments of its original self. Uh, and those fragments are too small and too isolated from each other to sustain the species within them that run our ecosystems. We had this idea that the Earth, our nest, was so large we could foul it forever and there'd be no consequences. Uh, but of course, we were wrong. We were wrong. And that's why we're getting these headlines here. Insect apocalypse is here. What does it mean for the rest of, of life on Earth? That was November uh, 2018, uh, followed by this one. We've lost 3 billion birds uh, in, in North America in the last 50 years. Let me remind you how big a billion is. One million seconds is 12 days. One billion seconds is 31.7 years. So billions is a big number, and we just lost three billion billion years. Uh, and then the UN says, uh, well, actually, we're going to lose a million species probably in the next 20 years, and they conclude, yeah, humans will will suffer. Now, that it bothers me that these reports, as depressing as they are, are reported as if it's inevitable, there's nothing to be doing. Not so. None of them are inevitable. As a matter of fact, none of them are options. We cannot allow these things to happen. So that's what we're going to talk about today. This is not a talk about the, the pox we have inflicted upon our environment, it's upon all of our, our houses. It's a talk about the cure for that pox. A little bit of effort from a lot of people is going to deliver physical and psychological and environmental benefits to everybody. And it's going to happen because we don't have any other choice. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. By the way, this, this headline is an apocalypse here. What does it mean for the rest of life on Earth? You know what it told us what it means for the rest of life on Earth way back in 1987. Um, Wilson, of course, a very, very famous uh, Harvard biologist and entomologist, um, just turned 90 this year. But in 1987, he wrote this paper, The Little Things That Know the World, the importance of the conservation of invertebrates. He's largely talking about insects. Uh, and very, very simply, he said, life as we know it depends on insects, which is news to almost everybody. Why? Well, if we lost our insects, we would lose the pollinators that keep uh, 80 to 90% of the plant on the, on the land, plants on the planet around. If we lost those plants, of course, the food webs that support uh, our animals, the energy flow through our, our ecosystems would change drastically, <clears throat> and the animals would have nothing else to eat. So our, our birds and our, our amphibians and reptiles and mammals would all disappear. We would lose our insect decomposers, which rapidly turn over nutrients. So instead of having that rapid nutrient turnover, the earth would essentially rot. Uh, and of course, humans, humans would not survive any of those, those changes. Well, this was 1987, and Nobody was worried about losing our insects in 1987. As a matter of fact, we were spending a lot of effort figuring out how we could kill them all. And we were good. We were good at that. Well, the good news is that um, we can save our insects. We can save the nature that they, they support. And we can do it in relatively simple ways. We just have to change the way we treat the plants around us. In other words, the way we landscape. And that's what we're going to talk about today. I think of landscaping as, as if it's, it's the way we cook. We cook for taste, because we like good taste. I like good taste too. So we, we make things that are so full of fat, so full of sugar, and so full of salt, that eventually they kill us. But they taste good. Well, we landscape the same way. We landscape for beauty, for aesthetics. We find the most beautiful plants all over the world. We, we put them in these associations. They're not communities, because they're not talking to each other. And they are beautiful. 
but they are no longer contributing to local ecosystems and it, it, it degrades those ecosystems in very dangerous ways, which will eventually kill us. So we, we need nothing less than a cultural transformation. How do we get away from, from that type of treatment of, of the land? Uh, just stopping uh, the degradation that we do daily uh, it's not good enough. We have to do that. We, can, we, we have to stop degrading everything. Um, but that's not good enough. The mutual impact is just leaving things the way we are. We have degraded too much now. So leaving the way we are is not an option. What we have to do is put them back together again. We have to actively restore ecosystems everywhere. And that includes where we live, where we work, where we play, and where we farm, although I'm not going to talk about that today. Let's just read about where we live. Why do we have to do this? But you know, as, as rational beings, we have no other choice. We live off the services that ecosystems produce for us. Let's just talk about briefly about what plants do for us. They make oxygen, pretty important. We all need that. They clean our water and slow its journey to the, to the salty sea where we really can't use it anymore. Um, right now, very important ecosystem service. They're capturing carbon and pumping it into the soil. Soil scientists tell us that, that uh, our soils can store seven times the amount of carbon that's in the atmosphere. But we've got to get the carbon into the soil. It's plants that do that. Really, really important. Uh, they also build the topsoil that holds that carbon and allows the other plants to, to be around. If there were no plants on the planet, all the topsoil would be in the ocean. It would wash away. There wouldn't be any topsoil. They prevent floods, they dampen severe weather, they do all kinds of things. Animals do important things too. First of all, they allow those plants to be there by pollinating them. They disperse the seeds of those plants. Um, they provide pest control services to keep those plants from all being fully by, by other animals. Um, and then of course, they, they also eat us. What we're doing now with our giant populations, we are using resources faster than they're being produced. Where do those resources come from? I call them ecological interests that was generated by healthy ecosystems a long time ago. Interests, uh, ecological interests is like the interest of the bank account. You can, you can draw it down, but pretty soon you're working on the principle that produced that interest. And when you draw the principle down, then you have no interest at all. That's called ecosystem collapse. It cannot continue. Ecosystems have collapsed in a number of places all over the world. The U.S. is a really rich place. We have a lot of resources and we don't, we don't see it here yet, but we don't want to wait until it gets to that, that point. So a lot of people have been thinking about how do we keep this from happening? And one of the, the earliest, one of the most brilliant writers on this subject, of course, was, was Ellen Leopold, on the early part of, of uh, the last century. He recognized right away that, that the oldest task in human history uh, is to live on a piece of land without spoiling. We've never been able to accomplish that task. Uh, societies everywhere, the, the mode of, of, of operation was to live on a piece, piece of land, spoil it, and then move someplace else. And when, when there were just a few of us, uh, that worked. Because we moved someplace else, the, the land we spoiled regenerated while we were gone, and we could do that for a long, long time. We did it for hundreds of thousands of years. But uh, 7.8 billion people can't do that. Now, there is no place left to, to, uh, to move. Um, yet, we, can, we still have that, that uh, mode of operation. We spoil land, and then, I don't know what, we're talking about going to Mars. You can go to Mars. I'm not going to Mars. It's not going to work. So, Alex said, we've got, we've got to change the way we operate. We have to develop what he called the land ethic. And he outlined this in his, his very famous book, Sam County Almanac. Um, it was his dream to be able to use planet Earth for what we need. We could, we could farm it, and lumber it, and graze it, and mine it, and hunt on it. But we need to learn how to do it without destroying local ecosystems. That's the land that he was talking about. What was interesting to me is he talked about being able to use the land and develop a land ethic uh, where we use it, but he didn't think about developing a land ethic where we live. And the only thing I can think of uh, as to why he didn't do that is, is that the notion that humans and nature can't coexist is so deeply embedded in, in our culture, and it still is today, that he didn't recognize it as an option. This was all going to happen someplace where people weren't living. Well, in fact, living with nature now is our only option. 
is the only option left for us because we're pretty much everywhere. Um, so we're going to have to develop a new type of land ethic, and that is one that includes uh, all, you know, rebuilding nature's associations right where humans uh, abound. That's what we need to do. So we're going to do that. There are a lot of places we can do that. Private land is, is one of those primary places. 85.6% of the, EF, the U.S. east of the Mississippi is, is privately owned. So let's, let's start with, with that. If we focus conservation in the areas that are not privately owned, our public parks and preserves, it's not going to work. It's doomed to failure because you can't eliminate 85% of the land and expect conservation to work. Those areas are too small. So let's look at some of these areas, not all private land, but this, these are places we have not thought about um, more all the time. Um, golf courses, two million acres of, of golf courses, airports. The Denver airport is twice the size of Manhattan. These are not trivial uh, spaces that we could make a lot more uh, nature friendly. And we have all the places we live in rural residential, and suburbia, and mixed area, urban centers, a lot of acreage there. Road size, we have more than 4 million miles of paved roads in the U.S. and each one of those paved roads has two sides to it. Some of them have a middle, too. Um, and railroad rights are ways to go on and on, but just those that I've named, they're answered to 599 million acres that have not been considered as areas where we can actually do meaningful conservation. How big is 599 million acres? It is bigger than Vermont, plus New Jersey, plus Maine, Virginia, and New New York, Georgia, Florida, Oklahoma, Montana, California, and Texas, all added up together. So, we, so not having a place to do this is, is not our problem. We've got a lot of places we can, we can do this. Every once in a while, I give a talk with Rick Gard, and the last time I did that, he, uh, he gave us some definitions, and one of them was, wilderness is the absence of, of humans, makes sense. Wildness is the absence of control. But the, the thing he said next is what caught my attention. Wildness is a renewable resource, and that's what we're talking about. We're talking about rebuilding ecosystems that can then take care of themselves without our constant control because we put their players back where they belong. A renewable resource. So what we need to do is rebuild nature, and we need all parts of nature, but we're not going to do that all at once. And I suggest we start with the, some of the most important features of nature. Things that are really driving things. Uh, and capitalism are one of those keys. Who says capitalism? <laughs> Actually, I'm not the only one. I'm not the only one. Dan Jensen, way back in 1988, said capitalists transfer more energy from plants to other, uh, other animals than any other type of animal. They're eating more plant material and more things to eat then. If you take capitalists out of food bags, many of them heard that they when they're feeding, they rear their young on caterpillars exclusively if they're in a really rich environment that has a lot of caterpillars. Hard to find these days. Uh, and they're not alone. There's increasing evidence that, well, first of all, we know that most birds rear their young on insects, but most of those insects are turning out to be caterpillars for, for many groups of birds. This is a, a data set that comes from my recent uh, PhD student, Ashley Kennedy who uh, had a citizen science project where she asked people all over the country to take pictures of birds during, during the breeding season and send her those pictures. When they're bringing the food back to the nest, they may do that here, which is somebody did. Hmm? That's it's still active, you can still do that. So what she did was look at the, the proportion of caterpillars within nestling diets for 20 families of birds, and 16 of those 20 bird families fed more caterpillars than any other type of insect to their, their offspring. So think what would happen to 60 of the 20 bird families if we took caterpillars out of the landscape. They would struggle and probably wouldn't be able to reproduce at all. So we need to ask why caterpillars. What is, what is uh, important about caterpillars? There are a lot of other insects out there, but the birds are definitely favoring caterpillars. Um, a number of reasons. One is that uh, most caterpillars are soft. So if you think of this caterpillar as a uh, Sausage with a thin wrapper around it. <laughs> the thin wrapper is exoskeletal and it's, it's undigestible. So birds don't want a lot of exoskeleton. So it's, it's really just like a sausage. It's loaded with, loaded with lots of good things. And because it's soft, you can stuff it down the throat of your, your offspring without your injury. If you've ever watched the parent bird feed, it's pretty rough. It's like a plunger. It's, uh, 
They're also relatively large prey items. One medium sized caterpillar is equal to the biomass of 200 aphids. And some of our birds do chase aphids around, and you want to chase 200 aphids, you get one caterpillar. They are nutritious. They're very high in, in fats and very high in protein. They have a low percentage of chitin, of exoskeleton, compared to many other types of insects, particularly beetles. Some beetles can be really numerous, uh, but beetles are not like little sausages, they're like little tanks. A lot of undigestible material and a lot of sharp edges, too. And it turns out they are the best source of carotenoids for birds during the breeding season. I, I, I mention carotenoids not because I love organic chemistry, but because I'm a vertebrate, and you're a vertebrate, and the birds are vertebrates, and we vertebrates don't make carotenoids. Only plants make carotenoids, yet they are essential components of our diet. So we have to get carotenoids, necessary components of our diet, from plants. And that is why my, my wife Cindy says I have to eat my, my carrots to get my baby carotene, and my tomatoes to get my lycopene, or whatever that is, to get my lutein. She makes sure I get all this stuff because they stimulate my immune system. So I've had access to lots of, uh, lots of uh, carotenoids. I am generally healthier. They are antioxidants. They run around our body and protect our DNA from oxidative damage. They improve color vision. When your mother said, eat your carrots, you will see better. She was right. She didn't know she was right. It turns out she was, she was right. Improves sperm vitality. Who doesn't need that? Improves <laughs> sexual attractiveness. We're talking about largely male birds that are taking blue teams and building pigments out of them and putting them in their feathers, and that's what makes them colorful. So this is a proprietary warbler. He's bright yellow because he has access to lots of lots of blue teams. And the brighter yellow he is, the more ladies he, he attracts. So very important. Uh, all right, they're getting these these uh, they're getting these carotenoids, different types of carotenoids from the prey that the bird chase around. But this is these are prey items that uh, many birds bring back to the nest. But the distribution of carotenoids across those prey items is not at all equal. The first two bars here are caterpillars. Many more carotenoids and than other types of insects. Third part is uh, orthopterids, things like crickets and grasshoppers. So they're high, not as high as, as uh, caterpillars. Um, here, here are the adult caterpillars, the boas and the butterflies, much lower in carotenoids because they're not eating green plants. They're partly in it, but not all those carotenoids carry over to the adult. Spiders even lower. Here's the earthworm way down here. The early bird gets the worm, but he doesn't get any carotenoids. <laughs> that's important because a lot of people see the robins with the ears and say, well, that's all they need. It's not all they need. It's not all they need. Does this matter to birds when they're feeding their young? Well, Ashley uh, did another study. She put GoPro cameras on the roof of bird bluebird houses, which took a picture once a second. And she had a lot of bluebird houses and a lot of GoPro cameras, and she did it for three years, so she ended up with nine million pictures. And out of the 9 million pictures, she found 7,628 useful pictures, ones that actually caught prey item being brought into the nest that she can identify. So what she's looking at is how frequently they were brought into the nest uh, versus the amount of carotenoids in their bodies. And it's a pretty nice relationship. Caterpillars brought in more than anything else, and they had the most carotenoids, followed by those, those crickets and grasshoppers. And then everybody else is nestled, nestled down here. For a bird, you're trying to breed, and you're in an area that doesn't have enough caterpillars, chances are pretty good you're going to fail. So we need to build environments that have enough caterpillars, but that means we need to know what enough caterpillars are. How many caterpillars does it take to make a good bunch of, of birds? And again, we use chickadees as, as an example, although the data for a number of bird species, it's all very similar. To bring chickadees, a clutch of chickadees to the point where they leave the nest, it's 6,000 to 9,000 caterpillars. Then after they leave the nest, the parents continue to feed the caterpillars for another 24 days, but they're flying all around, so nobody's been able to count that. So you're talking about many, many thousands of caterpillars to make a clutch of birds that are a third of an ounce. Four pennies for the, for the birds. And if we want chickadees breeding in our yards, we need to have that many caterpillars in our yards. So how do we landscape for caterpillars? This is a new goal in landscaping. We've been landscaping in the past for no caterpillars to make sure there's not a living thing in our, in our yard. <laughs> so how do we do that? Well, we add caterpillars to the landscape by getting the plants to make them. That makes sense. Uh, but there is a catch. And the catch is all plants don't make caterpillars. And they certainly don't make them eat. And that's because caterpillars, most of them, the 
Vegetarian geckos are host plant specialists. They can only eat particular plant lineages. Which means you've got to add that plant lineage if you want that particular caterpillar. And the monarch, of course, is a great example. It's a specialist on, on milkweeds. You can put your crepe myrtle in your yard, but it's never going to support monarchs. And if you're waiting for monarchs to adapt to the crepe myrtle, you're going to wait a long time. <laughs> there's, a, there's an expression in Spanish that says, you better wait sitting down. <laughs> What happens is the, the monarch disappears. It's not going to adapt to, to uh, a non native plant. Um, we actually have some data now looking at, at uh, why caterpillars are specialists and how many specialists there are. First, we'll just talk about why uh, this, is, this is not news. They're specialists because plants protect themselves chemically. They don't want to be eaten. They want to capture the energy from the sun and use it for their own growth and reproduction. So they load their leaves with nasty tasting chemicals. Secondary metabolic compounds, so maybe those things are either bitter or downright toxic. And if you don't believe me, pretty soon it's going to be spraying. Leaves with the mouth. Grab a leaf and eat it. I don't care what it is, just eat it. You're not going to like it. You're not. There is a reason that we can't get our kids to eat their vegetables. They inherently know they're toxic. <laughs> so it's a really effective defense that keeps most of the insects of the world from eating most of the plants of the world, and that's why it's green out there. In the summertime. It's not because there are no insects that want to eat the plants, it's because most of the insects that are out there cannot eat those plants. They are too well even. But we do know that insects eat plants, so how do they do that? How do they get around those, those defenses, though, those chemical defenses? Well, this is where the specialization comes in. Um, what they do is they develop adaptations, they evolve adaptations that allow them to eat plants without dying. They develop particular enzymes that detoxify those, those compounds and store and excrete them. They develop behavioral adaptations and life history adaptations that minimize their exposure to those compounds. But that takes a long period of interaction with that particular plant. Those adaptations don't happen overnight. So now, here's the data that, that suggests how many caterpillars are actually specials. In the past, first of all, we've been guessing about this for the last 45, 50 years. Uh, and we said, well, this caterpillar eats, eats five, six, seven, eight plants. Uh, if it eats one plant, it's a specialist. If it eats five or six, it's a, it's a you know, when you get up there, they say, well, that is a generalist. It can eat lots of plants. Let's look at it from the perspective of how many plants these caterpillars cannot eat. Because that, I think that's ecologically more meaningful. This line here, let's imagine that that is a, uh, a specialization continuum. At this end, we've got an absolute generalist. He can eat 100% of the plants that it encounters. And at this end, we've got an absolute specialist, and only one type of the plant that it encounters. Uh, and the red here is the distribution of host plant records for all of the host plants that we know about in North America. There are about 12 to 14,000 species of moths and butterflies. We only know what about 7,000 of them. The others are still, still a mystery. And out of those 7,000 records, this is where they're all, all bunched out. There are no caterpillars that can eat all the plants they can, or 80%, or 60%, or 40, or 20. If you blow this up, um, the most special or generalized uh, caterpillars that we have are introduced species, introduced pests. Here's the Iowa moth, it's a native. It's the most generalized native uh, moth that we have. But it still can only eat a little bit more than 4% of the plants that it encounters. Most of the insects can eat less than 1% of the plants that we have. What this is saying is even the insects that we consider to be generalized can eat anything that's out there are actually highly specialized. And that means plant choice matters. When we bring plants from someplace else, there's very little chance that they're going to support a lot of chemicals because even our generalists don't have the adaptations to be able to use them. And I'm going to use some examples uh, of places where this, this is, has been done. Uh, and I'm going to start with, with our house. Uh, we live on 10 acres in Oxford, Pennsylvania. Uh, and that's what it looked like when we moved in. The area had been mowed for hay, and then, of course, the bulldozers all clouded up. But, you know, there really were very few plants here. When you mow, you don't, you don't have a lot. The plants that were there were largely non natives. When you're mowing for hay in the east, you're mowing Guatemala uh, and Multiflora Rose and Oriental Bittersweet. With it, all those things. That's the root stock you get. Um, well, when we moved in, we wanted we had two goals. One was to start to get rid of those those plants from major those invasive species, 
constructed with the plants that would actually bring life back to, to our yard. Uh, so how did I pick those plants? I like pretty things just like everybody else. Uh, but I tend to focus on caterpillars. What's a pretty caterpillar? I like the Canadian outlet. I think it's pretty. I wanted to have it breeding at, at our house. So I had to put the plant with the Canadian outlet means, which is meadow root. It's the only thing it needs. I planted some meadow root. That's, that's what its adult was like, interesting leaf uh, I planted meadow root. And I, you know, I didn't know where they had to come from. Maybe they had to come from Canada. But I knew of no Canadian outlets near our house. I knew of no better room near our house. And I was prepared to wait years for the Canadian outlet to find our house. So I planted them. The plants grew nicely. I went out after about a month to look at the, the uh, better room and they were defoliated. The Canadian outlet had found it right away and uh, didn't have enough, enough better room. Well, now we've got a good population of better room in the Canadian house. So that worked really well. That encouraged me. I'll do that again. I wanted this beautiful moth, the gold brown stowaway. Every time I, I see a pretty moth that I've never seen before, I want it in my house. So that's how I feel. Really like. Gold brown stowaway is a mis misnomer. It has nothing to do with gold brown. It's a specialist. That's what its caterpillar looks like. It's a specialist on this plant, Vitus aristosa. It's daisy. You often get it in uh, a little bit of wetter areas, although that's mine and mine. So I planted ditch daisy. It took a year, one year. And then finally those, those moths came. And the population gets bigger every, every year. Very exciting. I wanted the hackberry amber because, because it's one of the invalid butterflies that ought to be at, at our house. We didn't have any hackberry. That's what it is. So I planted some hackberry. And it took about three years for the hackberry ambers to find it. Uh, but now we have hackberry ambers. Very nice. I did not plant golden rod. It came in on its own. But along with the golden rod came all the neat things that it did. Like the brown hooded outlet, the cinder flower moth, goldenrod leaf finder, the goldenrod ball moth. This is what I'm still waiting for, the goldenrod flower moth, and it's a cool, cool thing, right? They're very localized. When you have them, you got a lot of them, and they don't move much. So this will be our 20th summer there. I still don't have goldenrod flower moth. But it's exciting, grand anticipation. It's like ketchup. Waiting for it to come out. So they may come this year. It's always great to look at we also get the, the uh, goldenrod that's uh, printed that makes the goldenrod ball that swelling you see on your goldenrod stems right now. Uh, and if you didn't cut down your goldenrod stems, uh, the birds that are overwintering in your yard will, will, will be happy because inside that swelling is the larva of that fly. Uh, and chickadees in particular, the titmice, uh, really they depend on those. I mean, you can do the really cold winters that we used to have. <laughs> so they, they, you know, they peck away at them, and this is what most of those golden brown balls look like in the spring. This is called natural control of things. And you know, we had nothing eating golden brown ball larvae, all the golden brown would have like, these balls on them. I don't think they'd be bad. They'd be bumpy. Um, and what is that? Daddy Woodpecker, they do the same thing. So these are these are more interactions. I planted uh, Parthenicis, this is a Virginia creeper. Uh, in, in my yard, one of the first things I planted because I've never seen a Pandora Spanx caterpillar. I think they're really pretty. I'd like to take their pictures and I wanted to see if I could attract them, so I planted it on my, my back porch. Uh, it took one year. One year it came and then I got the beautiful uh, moth. But I got other things to eat. Right, this is, I got the hot Spanx and several other insects. This is what I'm waiting for, more anticipation, added space, a specialist on, on uh, native grapes and Virginia creeper, that's what the adult looks like, maybe this year. I want to see for swallowtail, it of course is a specialist on pawpaws, we planted pawpaws, uh, and we got the zebra swallowtail, but I could never find its, its caterpillar. Finally I read it, what the caterpillar does, it's nocturnal, and it crawls right down to the to the duck in, in, during the daytime. So I've been out to five in the morning, and there they are. Yeah. <laughs> but I got the pawpaw sphinx before it took nine years to get the, the zebra swallowtail. The nearest population was 26 miles away. Uh, and I got things that I didn't even know exist. I didn't know there was a, a pawpaw sphinx. And we got lots of pawpaw sphinx. Planted oaks. Uh, this is the Bedford oak up in, in Bedford, New York. It's They're arguing about whether it's 400 or 500 years old. Uh, I don't have any 500 year oaks on my, my property, they're 19 years old. But I got a lot of things right away. I had no idea what oaks were going to attract to, to our house. Things like the solitary oak leaf liner, juvenile's dusky wing, the yellow shouldered slug, the orange headed epicalina. The 
red washed caterpillar, the yellow vested moth, the orange tufted omnia, the spiny oak caterpillar, the two spotted oak monkey, the variable oak leaf caterpillar, the red monkey oak worm, the orange hunky oak worm, the pink striped oak worm, the delightful dagger moth, the pleasant dagger moth, the lesser oak dagger moth, the green moth, <laughs> the spring dagger moth, the afflicted dagger moth, the brown people lakers, the white flotch header and panther, the elite header and panther, the red line caterpillar, the dagger. Many, many more have come to our arms. That's how we learn that they're the most powerful plant you can put in your yard if you want to make caterpillars. And remember, we want to make caterpillars because they're what driving the, the food waste. Uh, it also stimulated me to count, start counting the, the number of caterpillar species that have come to our house by putting all these plants back. And I'm up to 905. Um, and I'm not afraid. Every time I go out, I get, I get new species. And because I've got 905, that's 905 species of bird food, I, we have 55 species of bird breed on our 10 acres. It works. It works. But I know what you're saying. You have 10 acres, and it's not going to work in suburbia with a little lot. Well, is that true? Let's go to St. Louis. We'll place that side of, of St. Louis to Marty and Dan Turpster's property, where she has a little, little bubbler. They have 0.6 acres uh, in Kirkwood, Missouri. They, the place was loaded with bush honeysuckle, another, another invasive. They pulled them out, they put in native plants, they installed their bubbler, a little bubbling feature uh, with, with moving water. They recorded 149 bird species. But here's the, here's the key, 35 species of warblers have stocked in their, their property. So many and so consistently that Marky has set up, she's got a blog and she takes pictures of them all the time. You go on and, and check it out. Just to compare, we've had eight species of warbler at, at our house. So that is a really productive property, 0.6 acres. It works with small properties. But what about urban yards? Really small properties. Let's go to Pam Carlson's yard. Um, and this is in Chicago. She lives right next to the runways of O'Hare Airport. Actually, <laughs> right next to Chicago's Kennedy Expressway, um, and, and one of the, the runways, tenth of an acre. That's three times smaller than the average lot size in, in the U.S. Uh, she has absolutely no connectivity with any preserved land. She is in the city. Well, she added 60 fruit species of native plants to her backyard. I don't like to talk about backyards because it suggests you got to hide this in the backyard because it's all so ugly. But she doesn't have a front yard, it's all cement. So she's in the backyard and a little, little water feature she's recorded. This is this is outdated. She's added 10 more species, 113 species of birds in the New yard, including a woodcock. So if anybody hasn't seen a woodcock yet, you can go to Chicago to stand in the Kansas yard and check it out. But what about inner city? What about right in the middle of, of, of a busy city, busy city, even more so than, than Pam? Um, well, I can tell you this story. I was looking at this, this butterfly weed, Sweetius tuberose, and it reminds me we really need to change the names of our native plants. They are not weeds. A weed is a plant out of place. This is not out of place. So we're going to call it the Monarch's Delight. <laughs> I was looking at this Monarch's Delight, and uh, this was 2014. Right away, so I saw a mega bees. I know it's, that's a complete cover. I know they're mega bees because they've got pollen on their tummy, not on their legs, and, and they're very cute. Um, but they've got very specific needs. Uh, not only do they need pollen and nectar, but they need soft leaves like you find in a red bud because they cut the edges out of those leaves and they stuff them with pollen and roll it up and then put that in a crack someplace. And that's how they, that's how they reproduce. It's solitary bee. So, if you have pollen, nectar, and soft leaves and cracks, you can have uh, mega cracks. You can have those big cracks. So, another species of mega cracks would be bumblebees. Of course, the red bud is, is blooming in the spring, which is that's as early spring blooms are essential for the queen bumblebees to come out and have to establish their, their colonies. And many other blooming plants there. But that is all modern. This is 2014. It was the lowest point of the, the modern population that we know of. I hadn't seen a single monarch the entire year before, and this was June. Monarchs don't usually get this far north uh, in, in June. Uh, and then I saw another one, two monarchs, fooling around the, the uh, monarchs of light by Wednesday, and there were other species of milkweed just starting to bloom, so they were there because they had what they needed. Do you know where I was? I was on the high line in the middle of Manhattan. 
and that is the extent of the nature. High Line is an elevated railroad bed. It's a top tourist attraction for, for Manhattan now because people are so scarred for nature, they want to walk here and interact with Mars Delay. Um, so that's, that's great, but what it shows is it doesn't take a lot of plants to have at least some level of, of ecosystem function to support some level of, of biodiversity, particularly if they are, are intelligently chosen. The, the highlight is not 100% native, but it's largely native. Uh, and, and it convinced me that you can have viable uh, bits of nature, viable interactions right in the toughest parts of, of everywhere. And one of them is we've got to shrink the lawn. We have way too much lawn, you all know this. We have an area of lawn the size of New England out there. We're still increasing it by uh, what, 500 square miles a year of new lawn. Um, this, is a, this is a dead scale. There are four things that every inch of, of North America, every inch of the, of the planet, needs to do on, on the land. Uh, one is support those food groups. Another one is support the pollinators, the complex pollinator communities that pollinate all of our plants. Not just in our parks, but everywhere. Manage the watershed. Watersheds need to be managed by plants everywhere and sequester carbon. Lawn is terrible at doing all four of these things. As a matter of fact, it's really good at wrecking your watershed. It's not supporting any pollinators, it's not supporting the food web, it's just, you know, it is not a good land choice. It's, it's pretty, but it's a dead zone. Um, so we've got over 40 million acres of lawn in the US. If we cut that area in half and put in the plants that are driving our ecosystem, we can create a new national park that will be 20 million acres in size. And if we do it at home, we can call it Homegrown National Park. And it'll be bigger than the Adirondacks plus Yellowstone plus Yosemite, plus Grand Tetons, Canyonlands, Mount Rainier, North Cascades, Badland National Park, Olympic National Park, Sequoia National Park, the Grand Canyon, plus the Nolly, which is huge, plus the Great Smoky Mountains. And of all those parks, still less than 20 million acres. If we do that, and if we do it at home, we're going to get a lot of benefits that you don't even get if you go to a real national park. Uh, first of all, you can enjoy nature at your own pace, at your own time, anytime, not just on a vacation. You can walk out your door and interact with, with nature. You can avoid crowds. You go to the Great Smoky Mountains, what is it, 40 million people a year? Or is it 4 million? I don't know. It's big crowds. Uh, it's free. You don't have to pay anything to get in here. You can avoid all the travel hassles that um, you travel, you know they're, they're hassles. Here's an important thing, you, need, you can experience the natural world alone. You know, they're doing research on how people benefit physically by interacting with nature, and they're wiring up people with electrodes, and they all march through, through a park together, uh, and then they see whether something's changed in their, their brain. It always does change, it's all for the positive, but what they're really interacting with is other people with electrodes on their I don't think that's a real exposure to nature. We take our kids on, on class trips so that they can see what the natural world is like. But that exposure is to 40 other kids and teachers telling them what they can't do. This way they can, they can spend the time alone and, and really get to know the natural world. And you can hunt lizards in the privacy of your own home. And I learned this from my granddaughter, who sent me this picture. Very easy. You have to crawl very quietly and slowly on the ground, and you have to disguise yourself with sticks. And, <laughs> and it helps if you have your best party on. <laughs> She's serious. She's a serious person. And you can do that. All right. Point number two. We're gonna we're gonna reduce the area of lawn. We're gonna make Hunter National Park. But the plants we're gonna put in the areas where we retain the lawn. Many of them have to be what I call piecemeal plants. It turns out that not all native plants are equal in their, their benefits to wildlife. About 5% of them are supporting about 75% of the producing the food that supports, that builds 75% of our, our, uh, our food webs. So we can't ignore these guys. I call them keystone species, remembering the, the Roman arch. The keystone is the stone in the middle. When you take that out, the arch falls down. If you take those, these kind of plants out of your, your food webs, they collapse. So again, what that's saying is that all native plants are equal. We can put a lot of different types of native plants in our yard.
there, but we have to focus on those, those powerful ones. So the question is no longer, are natives better than non-natives? On average, they certainly are. Uh, but the question really is, how many ecologically productive plants do we want in our yard versus ecologically benign or, or destructive plants? Um, there's room for compromise, but we certainly can't avoid these guys. I get emails um, a couple times a year. Some people will send me an email saying, don't you know that ginkgo, ginkgo pyloba from Asia, actually grew in North America seven million years ago? Therefore, it's native. Therefore, I can plant it. That's not our metric anymore. Ginkgos produce zero caterpillars. I don't care if they grew in the moon seven million years ago. They're not going to rebuild our food webs. That's what we have to start thinking. Compared to oaks, in this area, 557 species of bird food, of caterpillars on, on oaks. The most powerful plants you can put. And that is true for 84% of the counties in North America. So it's pretty easy to figure out which one you're going to start with. Let's just look at how, how important keystone oaks are in my yard. Remember, I've got 905 moss species that I know of so far. Of that 905, 800 have known host plants. So I, there's 105 species. I don't know what they eat. Some of them could eat it, but I don't know this. We're not going to think about this. Out of the 800 species, 242 of them use oaks. We have 59 genera of native woody plants in, on our property, only one of which is quercus, the oaks. So what this means is oaks represent less than 2% of the woody plant diversity at our house, but they're supporting at least 30% of our moss species. That's a keystone plant. If I didn't have oaks, 30% fewer species. Okay, point number three, keystone plants work, but only when we don't have a lot of lights on it. This is trouble. This is trouble. I'm telling people to put, put these plants in your neighborhood and you will really increase biodiversity and you will somewhat. But um, when you have lights on it, it calls these, these are mostly moss, calls them in at night and kills them, and then they're not on your tree. That's the end of your, your food web. And you know. Drive around at night, how many people have lights on at night? It's, it's a habit we have. Uh, so if it's a security issue you're thinking about, put a motion sensor on it so that it only turns out when the bad man comes. And you'd be amazed how often the bad man does not come. <laughs> then you can have the light up. But look, when it's on, it throws completely dark shadows. That's where the bad man can hide. He knows how to get around when the light's on. But if you have a motion sensor, he doesn't even know it's there. Or, even easier, replace the white light bulb with a yellow bulb. And a yellow LED bulb is the least attractive to insects. You will attract very few insects in, in the most with yellow LEDs. If everybody replaced their outdoor lights with yellow LED lights, overnight we can save billions of insects in North America. It's the easiest way to reverse this insect. And then the keystone plants will start to function as they, they do with their very few lights. What are the keystone plants? Uh, you can go to Native Plant Finder, National Wildlife Federation website, put in your zip code, and the ranked list of, of uh, woody plants and herbaceous plants will pop up for your county. This is just uh, the top ones uh, for this area. Um, a similar website for, from Audubon, um, for, uh, uh, Plants for Birds. Uh, and you will, you will end up with a similar list. Notice I say, so here's here are the oaks, number one, native oaks. You can plant Quercus robar, the English oak, or Quercus sagittarius, the, the sawtooth oak from China, but we've got over 90 species of oaks in North America. Why do you need to go to China to find one? But you know, that's what our wildlife people are doing, or have been doing. Chinese oak, the, the sawtooth oak makes a lot of acorns. So they've been planting that for wildlife for a long time. <laughs> Turns out those acorns are really, really bitter and wildlife don't like it. So anyway, not, not knowing what plant to put out there is not an issue anymore. We, we now know what the powerhouse plants are. But the fourth thing we need to think about is how to plant these plants in a way where these caterpillars we're trying to create can complete their larval development. And this is what I'm talking about. So I live in Chester County, Pennsylvania. In Chester County, Pennsylvania, there are 511 species of caterpillars that use oaks. A few of them, like the polyphemus moth, complete the life cycle on the tree. And I wish all of them did. 
It eats the leaves, it spins a cocoon, it hangs from the, the twig, it emerges as an adult, and then it does it again, and it all happens on the tree. So if you have an oak tree, you can have these, these polyphagous spots that would be great. But most of them, 480 of those species, 94% drop off the tree to complete their development. They either tunnel into the ground when it's loose enough, and they can do that and pupate underground, or they spin a cocoon in the leaf litter under your tree. You see where I'm going here. There is no leaf litter under your tree. And the ground is so compact and mowed all the time, it's, it's not a good place to be a caterpillar. And the cement landscape is, is even less inviting. I am not trying to discourage the use of trees in, in uh, cities. I am trying to cut down the amount of cement. I mean, that is, that's a watershed issue. We're doing it just because we're lazy, nobody wants to maintain. This is the typical scenario. We put trees in our yards, there's grass everywhere, and we're going to start to measure how, how well caterpillars survive after they you know, complete their development in a situation like this. Um, we haven't done that yet. There, I'm sure there's some amount of survival. I hope, I hope. But this is the way of it. Have a tree and then build a layered landscape under it. Put your native azalea under there, your ferns, your ground covers. This is where you can do your, your uh, spring ephemeral gardening. Those are safe zones for your caterpillars. You're not going to mow it, you're not going to walk on it. The, the soil is not compacted. A very safe place to be a caterpillar. Or put your, your wild ginger and other ground covers in. And it's also the way to reduce the area of this lawn. Expand the area around your trees. So without even planting anything, any other trees, although you should, you can reduce the area of this lawn. Um, room for compromise. I mentioned compromise a few minutes ago. We've learned that we actually can compromise here. It was, it was data from uh, Desiree Naranjo's uh, PhD thesis. She uh, worked with chickadees in the suburbs of Washington, D.C. Inside the Beltway, she measured how well chickadees uh, reproduce in relation to the plants where they were reproducing. And she did it over a three year period, and a market of people working for her. And she was able to compare properties that were dominated by non native plants. Not 100%, but dominated by non native plants with properties dominated by native plants. Again, not 100%, but dominated. Uh, and when they were dominated by non native plants, those properties produced 75% fewer. So we've already reduced the, the amount of bird food for the chickadees by 75%. Um, they were 60% less likely to have breeding chickens. Does there even put up a chickadee house? I mean, tree holes are in short supply in the suburbs of D.C. If you put up a, a house, the birds would come and try to use it. But 60% of the time, they looked around and said, there is not enough food here. We're not even going to try. We're not going to build a nest. If they did build a nest, they made 1.5 fewer eggs. Those clutches were 29% less likely to fail entirely. Those nests produced 1.2 fewer fledglings, and the, the rate of development was delayed by 1.5 days. And the birds that left the nest were lighter than the birds in a primarily native habitat. You might say, well, those aren't, those aren't huge differences. But when you add them all up and put them into a population growth model, this is what you get as a percentage of the non-native plants in your landscape. This dotted line here is, is replacement rate. That is the rate at which the population has to make babies to replace the adults that die every year. Chickadees don't live that long. If you wait this many babies, you have a steady population, sustainable. It's not growing, but it's not decreasing. Anything above that line is a growing population, and anything below the line is a declining population, an unsustainable population. And they interact, or they uh, overlap right here at around 30% non native plants. So when you have at least 70% native plant biomass in your yard, you can have sustainable breeding bird populations. But this is the area of compromise. You know, I looked at compromise in the dictionary the other day. It's not there. Yeah. We'll check it out. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> That's a joke. <laughs> we can put it back in the dictionary. This data is here because you can have your pretty plant. You can have your non-invasive, pretty, Asian plant as long as it's not more than 70% of the plant biomass. And then you can have a viable, viable uh, food web in your yard. Can we use native plants in formal designs? I got this, this picture from um, somebody. 
remember who it was. It wasn't that long ago, but he's the land manager on this property, and he's sneaking native plants in. Look, he's got his Joe Pies in there. He's got a, his, his goal is to convert the entire thing into all natives. Uh, he's well on his way. Just to prove, you can have a formal design with native plants. Formality is not a function of native of plants. It's a function of the design. Our native plants are used in formal designs in Europe all the time. I guess it's okay over there because they're non-natives. <laughs> what can municipalities do to help us get there, help us, help us reach these goals? Um, well, Minnesota, throughout Minnesota, there's a cost-sharing project set up. If you want to replace part or all of your lawn with prairie, they will, they will help you pay for it. Good deal. And that does two things. Not only does it give you a little bit of money to work with, but it gives you cultural permission to do it. Your neighbor's not going to say, what are you doing? You say, hey, the township is paying me to do this, and I'm the good guy, you're the bad guy. There's an island in Florida who's paying its residents to allow burrowing animals and native species to burrow in their front yards. Because, of course, the, the housing has come and re displaced all these animals, but they don't care about the people, they just want a place to burrow. And it's working. It's working. So there's a lot of things that our, our, our municipalities, our tax structure, could do to turn this around almost overnight. I think we made three missteps. In, in the early years of conservation, uh, you know, we were sincere about it. We wanted to save nature because we knew it was important, but we didn't think it was essential. It was always pretty low priority. If we had any leftover money, yeah, we we use it for that, but it was never ranked uh, very high. I was in the uh, Cincinnati Zoo not too long ago, and this was a wall-sized poster. Uh, this says, "We need to save wildlife for future generations," and we have heard that over and over again. But to me, that suggests that nature is there for our entertainment. We want to entertain our kids in the future. We want them to see the rhino and stuff like that. We need to save nature so we have future generations. And it's a lot more urgent than these science suggests. We've assumed that humans and nature can coexist, which means our conservation efforts have been pushed off into little, little teeny marginal areas that are destined to fail because they are too small and too isolated from each other to sustain the species within them. David Quammen has this, this analogy between a Persian rug and an ecosystem. That is a Persian rug. That is not 71 Persian rugs. That is not anything. It's a bunch of scraps, and that's how we created our, our ecosystems. Roy Dennis in England says that land ownership is more than a privilege, it's a responsibility. What he's talking about is how we treated the land of planet Earth. This is planet Earth, and it is covered by the biosphere. If planet Earth were an egg, the biosphere would be thinner than an eggshell. That is where all the life that we know of occurs. All, all there. It could be all the life in the universe, and it's certainly all the life we're ever going to interact with in the universe. It's right there in the biosphere. But we have chopped it up into private land ownership. Tom owns this, Dick owns this, Harry owns this, Mary owns that. Along with that ownership comes the responsibility of stewarding all the life in the universe. I can't think of anything more, more awesome than that. But of course, landowners now don't know that. They don't think about that. Privately land owned land everywhere. Um, whatever you do on that private land impacts not just the private landowner, but everybody around. Again, it's another, another new concept. It's not that new, really. If you have a stream going through into your yard, you know you're not allowed to pour cyanide in the stream, because we get it that the stream leaves your yard. That's not yeah. good stewardship. We know you're not allowed to open up a bottle of the smallpox for us. We understand. But we plant invasive plants that are ecological tumors and go everywhere and wreck ecosystems, as if that didn't matter. Whatever we do on our property impacts not just us, but everybody else. So that's the type of responsibility that we're talking about here. The UN designates biosphere reserves as places of ecological significance, and I hate that terminology, because it suggests there are places on planet Earth with no ecological significance. Not so. Every inch of the planet has ecological significance, including your yard. So what we need to do is glue these patches back together again by putting the plants Rebuilding ecosystems in between those parks and preserves, and rebuilding functional ecosystems everywhere. We need to do that for our own good. But in the meantime, we'll save a lot of other.
other species. Our third big step was to, to leave Earth stewardship to a few specialists, a few scientists who study restoration or, or uh, ecology. As if it weren't an inherent responsibility of everybody on the planet. Everybody on the planet benefits from essential ecosystem services, which means everybody has the responsibility of being a good, good Earth steward. Good Earth steward. I'm not sure how we got away from that. I mean, that. So you don't have to say biodiversity for a living, but you can say it where you where you live. And I love this approach because it empowers each one of us. And that's good. Because it's going to take each one of us. Even if you don't live uh, in a, on a piece of property, if you live in a city, and that's a lot of people, 82% of us live in a city, you can volunteer to help manage a piece of property nearby you, a park or preserve. They all need your, your volunteer hours because they're all understaffed. They, they don't have enough, enough funding. Um, but it also shrinks the problem down to something that's manageable for each one of us. Don't worry about the entire planet. Worry about your little pieces of, of it. Get rid of your invasive species, shrink your lawn, plant those keystone plants, put in a pollinator garden, do the things you know we, we need to do. Uh, and not only will I be happy, but everybody around you will be happy. So as property owners, each one of us has the, the power we have the responsibility, we have the opportunity to fix landscapes like this. You are nature's best friend. Thank you. So if you can find places in your property to put to keep your leaf litter. You know we have a don't let any water leave your property policy. Don't let any leaves leave your property either, because they're they're a really important part of the equation. Yes. You mentioned a lot of native plants. What parts of vegetable garden plants do you have? Uh, what part do vegetable gardens have? In terms of what I'm talking about, no part. Those are two, those are apples and oranges. It is a good thing to have vegetable gardens in our yards. It cuts down on, on the transportation of food. You can control what's on your vegetables, you know, whether you spray it or not. Um, a lot of good things associated with having locally grown food. But um, that's a different issue. We're not going to save biodiversity with, with locally grown food. Because most of what we eat are not, not natives. We're not natives. We brought the food with us. Um, so I don't want to discourage that. It's just not what I'm talking about. Yes. E.O. Wilson's one half Earth policy. Comment? Yeah. Um, 2016, E.O. Wilson wrote a book called Half Earth, and he said, if we don't preserve ecosystem function on half of planet Earth, uh, we're not going to have ecosystem function anywhere. And then, of course, it's the end of us. And he spent most of the book talking about the science that supports that statement, and then he ended the book. 
Well, that telling us how we're going to do that. That's an issue because half of planet Earth is in some form of agriculture right now, and we're in the other half. All of them, 7.8 billion of us, all of our infrastructure, all of our airports, all of our everything are in the other hand. And that's why I'm talking about this, because that's where we have to stay in nature. That's where we have to rebuild those, those food webs. That's why we have to toss out the idea that humans and nature can't mix. We have to mix, unless you want to throw out agriculture. And we're not going to get far if we, if we push that. So We can do a lot more in agriculture than we're doing right now. But we, we also, we cannot... Uh, consign conservation just to those little hot spots of diversity around the world. We've got to do it everywhere. Yes. Fantastic talk. Do you have the list of the native plants that you were mentioning in your book, the latest book? Well, they're on that website. Okay. And I have the website. And the website yeah. in the book? Because for every county, it changes a little bit. That's why it's a county specific list. Yes. Pressure on the uh, industry and or, let's say, architects and people that are doing these things to move in this direction? Um, yeah, I like the word pressure. Uh, it's new encouragement. Yeah, it's new new information. Any landscape designers here? This is how it happens. I talk to landscape designers like you, landscape architects, all the time. I've talked at the national meetings of. Of the ASLA three times. Um, nurserymen have, are figuring out that this is a this is a growth market. Uh, early on, I gave a talk to, to nurserymen, and the guy who sat in the front row with his arms folded, and he said, "You're trying to put us out of business." And I wasn't clever enough to think of anything until I was driving home. <laughs> and I said, "Wait a minute! There's 129 million homes in the U.S. If everybody who landscapes is not going to put nurserymen out of business, I do want to change their inventory." But they don't care, they just want to sell plants, their business is sell plants. And they're figuring out this, people are interested, there is a market here. So it is changing. I've watched it for the last 10 years. Um, it's a huge cultural shift. And there's a lot of education that has to happen. And that's why I read these, these books. But it is happening. I do see a change. We haven't hit the threshold where it's going to become the norm and then everybody follows. But we're getting it. We're getting it. Who asks us a question, no one specifically says that they should do this for. They don't have the power to trust the lecture or the resource. What do you mean they can't be fine? You know, I, all right, I use, I use birds as a hook. A lot of those people put up birds because they like birds. They don't see the connection between the plants in their yard and, and birds. But if you say you need the plants to make the bird food, most people think birds want seeds and berries, so they're always thinking of seeds and berries. But you don't reproduce on seeds and berries, you need insects. And that simple connection does grab a lot of um, people. But don't throw out the idea of reading them. <laughs> <laughs> Can you talk about current research on the cultivars? Current research on cultivars. Um, we, did, we did a project with, uh, sponsored by Mount, Mount Cuba Center. We were looking at the impact of cultivars so a cultivar is a genetic variant of a plant. So we're talking about cultivars of native plants. A lot of people call them native plants. Um, what's the impact on the, on the insects that use leaves? We did not look at flowers. Anyway, White at the uh, University of Vermont uh, did her PhD looking at what happens when you, you pull around with flowers. We looked at six different traits. So when you have variegated leaves, when you take a green leaf and make it red or purple, when you have a tall plant, make it short, when you introduce disease resistance, when you enhance fall color and enhance fruit size, those were our six traits. The only one that consistently made a negative impact on the local insects was taking a green leaf and making it red or purple. Which makes sense because that's putting anthocyanins into the leaf, which changes the chemistry and they don't even recognize it. It's a feeding detergent. They don't recognize it as their host anymore. And we love our red leaf plants. That's because we're still making plants are just decorations. They are decorations, but let's keep some straight species in there that are doing what we know they can do um, to help help maintain the things around us. The one thing that so we didn't find a lot of negative effects. There are actually more negative effects when you pull around with flowers, but most cultivars are propagated clonally. 
So there's zero genetic variability in that cultivar. And, and in the age of climate change, any age, but particularly now, we need as much genetic variability in our plant material as possible. Look at that. This morning at my house, it was 19 degrees. Right now at home, it's probably about 58. Those huge temperature changes are very hard on plants and they're very hard on, on insects. The only way we're going to have plants that can deal with that is to have plants with lots of genetic variability. So I'm trying to encourage uh, the, the nursery industry to offer the stray species as well so that you get to be some. They're, you know, a hundred years they've been thinking that you're only going to buy a plant that's really pretty uh, and it's a double flower and, and all these things. You got to convince them you'll also buy functional plants. Yes. You have uh, a one web page under the Bringing Nature Home that uh, is entitled The Problem. It has a photograph, several photographs of birds. Do you, do you know what I'm talking about? And it, it says in very, very few words the problem is what we can do about it. And, and that is what. What I think. Oh, good one. Okay. Yeah. Go to my uh, I use that as a handout. Okay. Thank you. Anybody else? Yes. Can you talk about LED lights and their effect on insects? Well, LED lights have the least effect. And it's, I can't give you the physics behind it. As a matter of fact, I can't tell you why insects go to lights. Not all of them do. Only about 70% of the moths, in particular, are attracted to lights. But nobody knows why. It's the wavelength. So they're attracted to particular wavelengths, and the wavelengths of particular LED lights are far less attractive. Blue light is very attractive, it's very close to the uh, ultraviolet. Um, that's why yellow LEDs are the least attractive. Okay, one more question, and then we'll sign once. Yes? You're, you talk a lot about the importance of adding native plants and for food for different species. Um, when we're removing our forests, I'm a forest in the background, when we're removing our forests, we're removing communities of plants and structures in the forest. Could you speak to how what we're doing on our urban yards might also recreate that structure and habitat? Um, she's talking about building a layered landscape, and then this uh, uh, book that I, I wrote with Rick Yard actually, I contributed three chapters, he did the rest. It's called the Living Landscape. It was back there, and it talks a lot about these layered landscapes. If you go into a natural system, you don't have canopy trees and then air all the way down to the ground. Uh, but that's typically what we do in our suburban yards. You want to have your canopy trees, then your understory trees, then your shrubs, then your ground cover, um, and then you, you want to put one where you walk. But near those other places, build that layered landscape. If you think about helping the birds find cover, most of our birds the vast majority of our birds breed in the understory and in the shrub layer. They're not having their nest up in the camp. Uh, and, and we don't have those, those areas in most of our, our yards. So think about the plants you can put under that big oak tree uh, to build that layer of nest. Thank you very much. Sales. Please come to our events. The Prince William Wildflower Society has a meeting on the first.